It was the autumn after I had the typhoid. I looked so weak and tottery that the two or three ladies I applied to were afraid to engage me. Most of my money was gone and I pretty nearly lost heart. Then one day, Mrs. Railton from the employment agency told me, Why, Hartley, I believe I've got the very place for you. A Mrs. Brimpton, a, a youngish lady, but something of an invalid, needs a lady's maid. She resides at a country place on the Hudson. It's a bit gloomy, but you're not particularly brisk yourself just now, are you? So, a quiet place with country air, wholesome food, early hours, ought to be the very thing for you. Oh, she's a kind mistress to all. Her former maid, who died last spring, had been with her 20 years and worshiped the ground she walked on. Why, you're the very woman for her. You're quiet, well-mannered, educated above your station. She likes to be read to. She really wants something of a companion. Well? I took the afternoon train. The butler met me at the station. It was a dull October day, and by the time we turned into Brimpton Place Woods, the daylight was almost gone. There were no lights in the windows, and the house did look a bit gloomy. I followed the housemaid Agnes upstairs. Another flight of stairs led to the servant's wing. Halfway down the passage, I saw a woman. She drew back into a doorway, and the housemaid didn't appear to notice her. She was a thin woman with a dark gown and an apron. I took her for the housekeeper and thought it odd she didn't say anything, but just took a long, hard look at me as we passed by. Facing my door was another which stood open. Agnes exclaimed, There, that door's open again. Is it the housekeeper's? There is no housekeeper. That's nobody's room. It's empty, I mean, and the door hadn't ought to be opened. Mrs. Brimpton wants it kept locked. Later, I joined the others for tea in the servants' hall, and I waited to see the pale woman in the dark gown come in. She didn't, however, and I wondered if she ate a part. But if she wasn't the housekeeper, why should she? Suddenly, it struck me she might be a trained nurse, and in that case, of course, her meals would be served in her room. When tea was over, Agnes brought me to Mrs. Brimpton. She was a delicate-looking lady, but when she smiled, I felt there was nothing I wouldn't do for her. I hope you have everything you need and that you won't be too lonely in the country. Not with you, I wouldn't be, madam. I hope you'll continue with that mind. But now I'm tired and shall dine upstairs. Agnes will bring me my tray and later you may come and undress me. Very well, madam. You'll ring, I suppose. No. No. Agnes will fetch you. Well, that was certainly strange. A lady's maid having to be called by the housemaid whenever her lady wanted her. Perhaps there were no bells in the house, but the next day I satisfied myself there was one in every room, and a special one ringing from my lady's room to my own. But whenever Mrs. Brimpton wanted anything, she rang for Agnes, who had to walk the whole length of the servant's wing to find me. But that wasn't the only queer thing in the house. I found out that Mrs. Brimpton had no nurse, so, I asked Agnes about the woman in the passage. Agnes had seen no one, and I saw she thought I was dreaming. I decided she must have been a friend of the cooks or one of the other servants. Perhaps she had come to town for a night's visit and the servants wanted to keep it a secret. Some ladies are very stiff about having their servants' friends in the house. The next day I said to the butler, I thought it odd in so large a house there was no sewing room. Why, there is one. Yours is the old sewing room. Oh. But where did the other lady's maid sleep? I, I don't rightly remember. Rooms were all changed about last year. Well, there's a vacant room opposite mine and I mean to ask Mrs. Brimpton if I may not use that as the sewing room. Uh, no, don't do that, my dear. To tell you the truth, that was Emma Saxon's room and the mistress has kept it locked ever since her death. Uh, who was Emma Saxon? the former lady's maid. What sort of woman was she? What did she look like? Oh, I'm no great hand at describing. I must go, my duties. Oh, please, please, just tell me, how did she die? Pneumonia, Miss Hartley. I found her one night, out in the garden in the dead of winter. 
She was in her bed clothes with nothing on her feet. I brought her in and we sent for the doctor, but it was too late. She never recovered. Why was she outside? She never said. So you take care, miss. You take care of yourself as well as the mistress. Things went on quietly for several weeks. My mistress was kind and my duties light. I had nothing to complain of, yet there was always a weight on me. Then one night after I put my mistress to bed, I went to my own room as usual. I lay awake listening to the rain, drip, drip, drip. After a while, I must have slept. Suddenly a loud noise wakened me. My bell had rung. I sat up, terrified by the unusual sound which seemed to go on jangling through the darkness. At length, I found the light and looked at the bell, and there was the little hammer still quivering. I was just beginning to huddle on my clothes when I heard another sound. The door of the locked room softly opened and closed. I stood stock still. Then I heard a footstep hurrying down the passageway, the floor being carpeted. The sound was very faint, but I was quite sure it was a woman's step. I turned cold, and for a minute or two, I didn't breathe or move. <sighs> then I came to my senses. I flung open the door and flew down the hall to Mrs. Brimpton's room. On the way, I heard nothing and saw nothing. All was dark and quiet as the grave. I knocked on her door. <sighs> there was no answer. I knocked again, loudly. <sighs> Hearing no answer, I opened the door impulsively. <gasps> I found my mistress very weak, but she forced a smile when she saw me signed for me to pour out some drops for her. Her breath was coming quick and her eyes were closed. Suddenly she groped out with her hand and said, Emma, is it time, Emma? It, it's Hartley, madam. Do you need anything? Hartley, what are you doing here? You rang for me, madam. No, no, that is quite impossible. But, madam, I heard it quite distinctly. No, I... You must have been dreaming. You may go now, Hartley. I thank you kindly. I'm quite well again now, you see. It was not until the next day when I had settled myself down to my afternoon sewing in my room that I realized how the events of the night before had shaken me. I knew that bell had rung. I knew I heard somebody come out of the locked room and walk down the passageway. The idea of spending another night opposite that door sickened me. But I tried to go on with my sewing as if nothing had happened. Then suddenly the, the sewing machine broke down. The butler said it hadn't been used since Emma Saxon's death. I stopped to see what was wrong when a drawer I had never been able to open slid forward and a photograph fell out. I picked it up and sat looking at it. Those eyes that searching look. It was the pale woman from the passage. I stood up, cold all over, and ran out of the room. My heart seemed to be thumping in the top of my head, and I felt as if I should never get away from the look in those eyes. I found the butler and held the photograph out. Who is that? Bless me. It's Emma Saxon. Where did you find that? I've seen that face before. No, that's impossible. No. To all appearances, Things went on as usual for a week or two, or so they did for the rest of the household. I had never been the same since the night the bell had rung. One night, when I had finished reading to Mrs. Brimpton, I was pleased to see she seemed much more cheerful in her manner and stronger in her condition. I went to my own room feeling quite bright and happy, and for the first time in weeks, I walked past the locked door without thinking of it. I looked out the window and saw snow falling. How much pleasanter than that eternal rain, and I pictured how pretty the bare gardens would look in a mantle of white. It seemed as if the snow would cover up all the dreariness inside and out. I heard Agnes' footstep come up behind me, and I turned, saying, Oh, just look, and But the words froze on my tongue, for there in the door stood Emma Saxon. I don't know how long she stood there, I only know I couldn't stir or take my eyes from her. She looked at me long and hard. Suddenly she turned, and I heard her walk down the passageway. I expected her to take the turn toward my mistress' room, but she put
pushed open the door that led to the back stairs. I followed her down through the empty kitchen and hallway. At the door, she hesitated a moment. Then she turned the handle and stepped out. For a minute, I hesitated. Where was she leading me? I saw her a few yards off. Her figure looked black and lonely in the snow. For a minute, my heart failed me, but all the while she was drawing me after her and I ran out into the open. What are you doing, Miss Hartley? Don't you see? It's her. Who, Miss? Emma Saxon. I see no one, Miss. Come inside, please. You'll catch your death. I turned back toward the garden, but it was empty. The night was black and the snow fell silently. (sighs) Shivering, I made my way back upstairs, delirious and exhausted, but no sooner had my door closed than the bell rang fast and furious. The door of the locked room opened and closed and footsteps raced down the passageway. (sighs) Out into the hall, I stumbled crying for my mistress. Down the main hall, I ran and pounded on her door. Madam, madam, it's hardly, are you all right? Mrs. Brimpton was standing, a horrible expression on her face. Her eyes were fixed on some object across the room and turning, I came face to face with Emma Saxon, dark, pale, and silent. Emma! Emma! And I saw my mistress sink back onto the bed and the death flutter passed over her face. When I came to, the butler said the room was empty when they found it. The door of the locked room was open, but the room itself was dark and silent. We buried the mistress on the third day in a driving snowstorm. And as I made my way back home alone to the house, I knew that the bell had ceased to ring forever.